Well, peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy, and this is your word at the middle of the week. As we listen to God's word at the middle of the week, we are studying the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, we are looking at what God opened to the Apostle John as he was in exile on the island of Patmos. That is, what did God disclose? What did he open up? What did he show him? And what he showed him was a vision of the heavenly realms. He showed him a vision of God's victory. It is a victory in the future. At the same time, it is a victory that is predicated upon the past, built upon the past. It is, in many ways, a description of that victory in the past with the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, a victory that is unfolding in John's life and a victory that is unfolding in our life as well. And so this is a book that not only talks about the future and what will happen, but also talks about what God has done and what God is doing even now. And we'll see that as we study it more and more. Last week, we looked at Revelation chapter 1. Pastor Johnson and I uh, walked through a couple different things there. We're going to try to do a chapter a week. Revelation chapter 2 then is up this week. And we'll see if we're able to keep that pace. There's so much in Revelation. It's so dense, like all the Word of God, that it uh, may be that we sometimes have to slow down and, and wait to finish chapter 4 the next week. Pastor Johnson is here, and so I'm going to add him and see if it will do that this time easily. But so far, so good. And there's... Hello, Pastor Johnson. Hello, good morning. Good morning. I was just introducing what we've done and where we're headed. I talked about how the victory described and disclosed by God to John uh, in Revelation is a victory not only relating to the future, but also to the past and to the present day. And so uh, we're not just reading sort of esoteric prophecy about future times that you have to have a special knowledge to understand. We're actually reading a public proclamation of who God is, what he has done, what he's doing, what he will do. And it is much more comforting than people often think. It is also, if I may put it this way, much more obvious than people think, right? Revelation is revelation. It's not dis it's not um, enclosure. It's not absconding. It's not it's not the great hiding given to John. It's the great revelation given to John. And so it's about showing forth what God is doing and not covering it up. Any thoughts or comments you want to share here at the beginning of the study, Pastor Johnson? But I, yeah, I think that's an important thing to, to remember because when people read Revelation, sometimes they'll think of, you know, weird, strange things like Nostradamus, who was yeah. so vague and just said uh, said everything with really, re really without saying anything at all. <laughs> I mean, when you make a, a prophecy, quote unquote, that is so vague and broad, eventually something's going to come true. Um, well, Revelation, like you mentioned, this, this is an unveiling, right? This is an opening that everything that John is writing to these churches, and we'll come across uh, four of them in chapter two, everything that John is writing to these churches made sense. So um, if there's things in Revelation that, that do not make that much sense to us, uh, that's not John's fault. That's our fault. And so, and we'll try to unpack that when we get there, because uh, the more you know the old testament the easier revelation is to understand with its um, right. word pictures yeah. and symbols and metaphors and so on and so forth so it, it's very clear um and we hope to to expose that clarity uh for god's people in this study sure good thank you uh this is also going to be the net this chapter chapter two chapter three uh and then uh, really, I guess not nothing beyond that, but chapter two and chapter three, this is going to be where our very simple technology here is going to be a little bit against us. It would be nice to be able to show everyone watching a map. I'm going to kind of try to do that here because we're about to look at the letters that God dictates to John to give to these seven churches in Asia. Again, when we say Asia in Revelation, we mean Asia Minor, Little Asia, 
that's present day Turkey. And the seven churches are all sort of located together there in Eastern Turkey, sort of Southeastern or south, Western, Western Turkey, sort of Southwestern Turkey. I'm going to hold up a map in my Bible. This is not, uh, you know, this is not spiffy technology uh, 1000 or anything, but anyway, there's, there you can kind of see it. Uh, there is a map of present day Turkey. So Greece is over here, Turkey is over here, and it's right around here that all of these seven churches were that uh, John writes at the behest and direction of God. And these churches are likely churches that were within the care or within the historic stream of John of John and his preaching. And so because we hear from history that he settled in Asia Minor uh, with, with the Virgin Mary for whom he cared. Uh, and this is attested to by very early church fathers, um, church fathers who, who lived before 100 AD and so who were contemporaries of John. We sometimes forget that. We forget that this is so historical that the people who wrote these letters in the Bible who, who experienced these things are people who um, are part of history, had historical peers that we know, whose writings we have. And so some of these early church names are like uh, Clement of Rome, uh, Papias, Polycarp, uh, people who, who, who would have known the apostles even. And so that's amazing to think about. Amazing to think that this is a um, this is a truly historical event. We can't emphasize that enough. I remember having a, a professor in seminary who said we're all Gnostic. What he meant by that is we're all people who kind of believe this is a made up myth until we go to the Holy Land and actually stand there and realize, yes, this happened in a real place at a real time. I he, he maybe was overstating that a little bit, I think. I mean, I don't think we're all Gnostic, but but he's saying it's it doesn't always become real to us until we really we actually see and touch the reality of it all. Anyway, uh, he's writing these letters to the seven churches in, in Asia Minor, but seven churches, the number seven being this perfect sort of divine number, reminds us that it's more than just letters to them, it's also letters to the whole church. Pastor Johnson, would you read for us the first letter. The first letter in chapter 2 is from verses 1 to 7. It is to the church in Ephesus. Now we already have one letter to the church in Ephesus written by St. Paul. That's the Ephesians, right? So the people who live in Ephesus are the Ephesians. They have a letter written to them called the letter to the Ephesians. That's in our Bible already. This is another letter to the Ephesians, not written by Paul, but recorded by John. And Pastor, could you please read it? Absolutely. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Thank you. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are explaining, we are defending, and we are comforting. We are explaining the text. We are defending it against false understandings. 
that often afflict people's minds. And we are bringing out the comfort because that's the ultimate purpose of the book of Revelation. So what needs to be explained here? That just, what are some, a couple of simple words here that we should explain, Pastor, before we go deeper into the text? Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe one thing that would be helpful to explain here is what is it that Jesus is trying to point out for this church, right? That there's something amiss with their love. And so touching on that, what, what is amiss with, the love, with their love? Um, but also explaining uh, like this group we hear about, the Nicolaitans, who are these people? We hear about them uh, in, in other places too in, in Revelation. We don't hear about them very frequently, but they're kind of there. And so John drops this name, the Nicolaitans, as if these people know who they are, and they do. Uh, we, on the other hand, 2,000 years of history, aren't exactly clear on who the Nicolaitans are, but we have a pretty good sense of what this group um, was about. So again, explaining the love, what's going on with love in, in Ephesus, what's wrong with their love, uh, and also who are these Nicolaitans? I think that would be a helpful yeah. Start. Sure. So let's talk about the Nicolaitans. Uh, they were Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans. Um, it's a funny name, possibly, you know, named after a, a teacher whom they followed. But we know from, uh, we know from early church fathers, we know from a later passage in Revelation chapter two, and we know from places like 1 Corinthians, where Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, which was a city within the same culture as, as Ephesus, that some of the problems the early church faced was the tendency of believers to participate in pagan rituals as well as Christian ones. And pagan ritual tended to revolve around two things, uh, the sacrifice of animals and therefore the eating of meat sacrificed to animals. That's what happened to the animals sacrificed. They'd be eaten. And then also sexual sort of orgiastic activity. And so the idea, because that was actually part of worship in, in the pagan uh, religion was to have sort of sexual rights. You know, there were temple prostitutes um, and there was a tendency to get really charged up, um, drunk, perhaps even, or just um, a little high on something, even if it's just emotion, and to have uh, and, and to look upon uh, sexual license and activity as uh, divine and a source of communion with the divine. And so, what what appears is that this is part of this is the part of the problem. Paul talks about this in the Corinthians, can you eat meat sacrificed to idols? He talks about sexual immorality in the church in Corinth. Here in chapter 2, in Revelation a little bit later, in verses 14 to 15, uh, when he talks to the church in Pergamum, we'll hear about this more, these two problems. And like I said, the early church fathers also said this. And, and so what's behind this? You know, what's behind this problem was the... Uh, sense that Christians would say, well, since we're free in Christ, uh, since our bodies either are going to be raised or are going to just, you know, in some understandings of the early church are just going to become nothing and we're going to become spirit people, uh, we, can, we can do what we want here and we can, you know, really enjoy ourselves and we can eat, drink, be merry and, do, and go beyond being merry. We can, um, we can sin. We can do what some of you prudish Christians are calling sin. We can go ahead and have sexual orgies, and we can eat meat, uh, sacrifice to idols, and participate in these things. That seems to be what the Nicolaitans are we're about, and that's what Paul is, or or John, God through John, is calling them away from. If I may just go a little bit early, Pastor. Yeah. Why not, anything more about that about Nicolaitans that you, that you think needs to be said? No, I, and, and we'll come across, I, I mean, the, the bigger issue that they represent is the issue of what we call syncretism, right? It, where you have this combination of, of cultures. You, you've got the, the, the Christian faith, 
and the pagan world that surrounds them. And, and so the, one of the struggles for the early church, as it is for the, for the modern church, is what part of the unbelieving world is still good, I guess. Uh, I mean, it's, it's all tainted by sin, but which can be appropriated by the church and, and what are things that cannot be appropriated? Um, and of course, mm -hmm. those festivals, the feasts and festivals were not because of, like you mentioned, not only idolatry, but ultimately the, the sexual immorality. I mean, there, there's a hard and fast line that the church grew uh, between celebrations and, and there's a there's a healthy way to celebrate and, and that's not one right one that demeans uh, human beings and treats really people as a means to an end utilitarian ethics as it were um, so yeah it's, it's going to be a, a that will and it still is an issue in the church today of course as we won't get into detail right now about that but um, it's still a specter that haunts the church the it makes, makes me think of the um the the of the da vinci code such a such an ordeal right about 18 years ago the da vinci code and uh, 18 17, 17 18 years ago this book that came out is it michael brown is he the author Dan in which he said that you know christian you know or the, he, he plays on the the theory that is held by many people that that Orthodox Christianity, as we know it today, is is a false Christianity. That original Christianity was sort of this, uh, you know, sexually a sexually free, a sort of a sexually free uh, flower power um, hippie sort of cult, and that within this original Christianity, uh, having sex with women was the only way that men could come close to perceiving the divine, that women had a more natural connection with the divine than men did, and that men, um, therefore, could only achieve that um, communion with the divine through sexual union with women. And of course, this is, this is being touted as this sort of fresh, liberating perspective on Christianity. But what something you said, Pastor Johnson, about how um, this approach is utilitarian. It tends to use people as ends to means. It reminded me of, of what dawned on me as I'm reading this book and dealing with fallout and questions about it, is that that was exactly the case. I mean, it, it was it, when you adopt that kind of perspective, you're actually turning women into vessels, right? You're turning them into tools that almost have an obligation to give themselves to men so that men can experience the divine, right? Uh, like I said at a, at a public talk about it, it's sort of like saying, um, well, we have to do this to get rid of our acne. You know, it's like the teenagers in the back of a car. Uh, if we do this, we'll get rid of our acne. That's the old, the old, the old joke from years ago. Um, it, it, you, instead of looking at it as an end in itself, sexual union, instead of looking at it as this, you know, beautiful expression of intimacy within marriage, it turns into this utilitarian thing for some other purpose and, and, and demeans it, as you said. So, I mean, it is actually worth pausing, I think, and, and, and reflecting on that. What's interesting is that it, it is present with the church already in the early church. It's already being denounced by the time John writes and records the, the revelation. So around 90 AD, mm -hmm. perhaps earlier, uh, as they're already- by Paul, yeah. Yeah, and, and by Paul, but even earlier than that, right, the Corinthians back around 50 AD. And so, I mean, it, it, from the beginning, it was clearly, clearly marked off as being not part of the way of Christ. One little thing I just want to explain to the, just to start at the top, verse one, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. So who is the angel of the church in Ephesus? Angel means messenger. Angelos means messenger. And so, uh, from what I understand, many people understand the angel of the church in Ephesus is a reference to the pastor of the church. Yeah, the leader, the shepherd, the, the pastor who is the preacher leading the flock. Yeah, the preacher. Yeah, yeah. The preacher. And so in a way, this is like a review of preaching. Uh, here is what your preaching has produced. Here are some problems that need to be addressed. And Christ is very clear because Christ is the one who holds the seven stars. He's the one who walks among the lampstands, right? That's Christ Jesus. And so um, 
it's very interesting that, you know, he, he has very good things to say. He talks about the works of the Ephesians. Interesting enough, Paul talks about the works of the Ephesians, how they have been prepared, good works have been prepared for them beforehand. He talks about that in Ephesians chapter 2. Here we see an emphasis on works also. They have good works. But he goes on to say, you know, repent or um, your lampstand will be removed from its place. What, what is that saying, Pastor? Right. Uh, you know, one of the great gifts of the church in Ephesus is that they have really towed the line on what is and what is not permissible in the church, and also in regards to doctrine, because often bad doctrine leads to bad morals, right? The bad morals and bad doctrine go hand in hand. And so their, their preaching, theologically speaking, is, is on point. They're, they're preaching the truth of the faith, uh, but, but something else has crept into, into the church, and that, that's what uh, Jesus gets at in verse 4 that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. And I wonder if what Jesus is getting at there is that since they're so um, keyed in, cued in on, on doctrine, is that you, know, you, can, you can forget that sinners who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, because of course these were you know, um, probably second generation, maybe some first generation Christians still in the church, uh, the, these people just didn't know the way. And so um, when you are dealing with sinful people, uh, they're going to fall off the, the narrow way that leads to life once in a while. And so you got you to pull them back on. And, and so perhaps in yeah. Ephesus, maybe because they were so stringent on, on what is and is not acceptable, theologically speaking, um, the, the people who may have erred uh, in what they said and what they did, perhaps even on accident, they may be you know, clamped down hard on them. Um, I mean, I don't want, I don't want to read too much into there, but, but there is something about their love. Uh, even though they had lots of good works, there's something about their love that was amiss. Um, namely, the love that they had for, uh, for one another, the love that they had at first. Some, something was not right that Jesus calls them out for to, to repent on. And it doesn't specify the love for one another. It doesn't, it, it, you know, it just says the love. It could be love yeah. for God, too, couldn't it? Could be. Yeah. I mean, the two go together. Yeah. Yeah, the two go together. Also introduced in verse 7, the, the, the verb conquer. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And so this word conquers, we're going to hear more and more within Revelation. Uh, the, the expectation of Revelation is that Christians and believers will conquer, that they were engaged in a struggle, in a fight, in a battle. And that puts a different cast on these letters too, does it not, Pastor Johnson? These letters now become marching orders. They become a directive to the soldiers at the front, right? <laughs> Uh, this is how you will conquer uh, from, this is how you will conquer in the, in the battle in which you are engaged. And so what is the battle in which they are engaged? Do we know that yet? Or do we know some of the contours of that battle yet? The yeah. battle in which we also are engaged today? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we all are engaged in that same battle those early Christians were, um, the battle against sin, uh, our, our own sinful flesh, the, the powers of, of evil at work in this world that seeks to uh, subdue and demean the church, which we'll see in other places uh, in, in Revelation 2, but also the work of, of Satan, because Satan does not like the church, uh, what she teaches, what she preaches, and how the Christians live their lives of faith. And so uh, the stronger your faith gets, you also will find that you have an adversary who tries to just as strongly dissuade you from that faith, you know. Yeah, no. so true. Well, I'll read the next letter, yeah. and then and then you can kind of lead us through that one. How's that sound? Sounds good. Okay, starting at verse 8. This is a church in Smyrna. Smyrna is not too far from Ephesus, relatively speaking. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. 
Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So what do we have there, Pastor? Mm -hmm. We see in, in Smyrna that there is some sort of persecution on the horizon and no doubt some persecution that they've been facing already. Um, so, so there's some of that, the tribulation, uh, but also there's some internal strife in the church as well. Um, as Jesus says to the church in verse 9, um, those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. And so there's some of those, um, some of the early struggle that we see in the church as uh, Gentiles flooded into the ranks of the church. And that caused no small issue with some of the Jews because uh, Gentiles had a different diet. <laughs> Um, and they had a different sense of morality, and that took uh, some getting used to. And so in the early days, of course, there was more Jewish Christians than there was Gentile. Uh, but here during John's day, I'm guessing the, the Gentile numbers are beginning to swell a bit more. And, and so there might be some of that internal strife going on between the, the, the old Jewish Christians who have been there uh, for a long time, for generations, and perhaps some of the new Christians. Um, Maybe there's some legalism going on there, those who say they're Jews uh, but are not, and you know, slander going on in the church. And so there's just some things going on inside the church that is, is seeking to uh, rip it apart from the seams. And that is, um, I mean, always a, a struggle in every church throughout all the centuries, uh, but particularly here in, in Smyrna. Um, so there's, again, some internal strife, uh, but also there's going to be some of the external strife coming as well. Um, the tribulation of, of some, some even getting thrown into prison uh, that they may be tested. So there's, there's a lot on their plate. They have a heavy load. Their, their struggles are different um, from, from Ephesus, from Thyatira, from Pergamon. Um, but still, they still need to be encouraged and, and, and warned of what, what is on the horizon they god has nothing against them right in this yeah. letter yeah there's no call to repent it's just a call to be faithful yeah mm -hmm. there's a recognition that they are they're in tribulation what does tribulation mean uh tribulation means you're coming into some kind of uh, trial uh, a, a, a time of suffering they've already been suffering apparently as you've pointed out and so um, the, the, the word here is more of an encouraging word. Be faithful. Hang in there. And so that's, God does, you know, God speaks to us differently depending on our situation. Ephesus, you have a sense of being at leisure. Not at leisure, but, you know, they're more settled. They're safer. They're, they're dealing with doctrine, with love, uh, struggling to be good, good lovers of mankind. Smyrna. Smyrna's under the cross right now, right. under the time of tribulation. So, so that happens to us in the church today too, doesn't it, Pastor? Mm -hmm. That we find ourselves in different seasons of the Spirit. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I mean, sometimes so we're... Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, sometimes we're, sometimes, sometimes we're... We, sometimes we... The church suffers in different yeah. parts of the world and... At our times, it has, you know, more domestic concerns. I mean, I, I, that's maybe a way, way to look at it. You know, there's a difference between domestic and foreign relations here. Ephesus has problems with their domestic relations, doctrine and love within the congregation, within their fellowship. Smyrna has problems with foreign relations. Uh, they're being persecuted from the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you want to read? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read uh, Pergamum since I know we're getting on in time here. We are, yep. So 12 through 17. 
And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who held, hold to the teaching of Balaam, who sought Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. All right. So again, we have the angel. That's a reference to the pastor or, or shepherd of the congregation. I know where you dwell, verse 13, where Satan's throne is. Um, there was a great deal of pagan worship in Pergamum. Early Christians are very clear. False gods are demonic. That's something to think about today, uh, the relationship between false gods and demons. I don't know that we talk about that enough. Do we, Pastor? Do we no, talk about I, it at it's, all? It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing that people don't like to address or to think about out of sake of toleration for their neighbor who does not believe in their uh, in the same God, who may have a different God, um, like the God of, of, of Islam or, or whatever. And so in the, in the American context, when we've really been reared on toleration for all things, um, it's almost easy to kind of ignore that fact that there are uh, lots of gods out there in the world, so false gods out there in the world, and to call them out for, for what they are um, as idols and, and ultimately demons. Because if, if this one true God, the God of and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if this is the true God, and he is, um, then therefore what does that mean about other claims uh, about the divine? Um, someone has to be right and someone has to be wrong. <laughs> And, and uh, people just don't want to think about that, that, that they could be wrong uh, about the faith. And, and in the Western church, maybe it's a, maybe a, a growing edge for us to remember that, yes, the, the early Christians, they were quite clear what they believed and who they believed in. And all these other gods, they did not tolerate um, because they saw where that idolatry le led to ultimately um, unfaithfulness, sexual immorality, some of the things we talked about uh, that was going on with, um, with Ephesus. Um, so yeah, we, we don't like to talk about that out of a sense of tolerance and not wanting to offend. Um, but those early Christians, they, they did get in trouble for being so offensive, right? How dare you Christians believe that there is only one God and and everybody else is wrong that's that's just so unenlightened and so bigoted towards these other faith traditions you know yeah right right um you said earlier that the more you know the old testament the better you will understand revelation uh in this passage we have two old testament references balaam and balak or balak um what do we know about Balaam and Balak? They, he, Balaam and Balak show up in Numbers. They show up in no, the book of Numbers, Numbers 23, 24, 25. Yep. Um, what can be said about them? Well, we know that Balak, uh, Balak summoned Balaam to prophesy against Israel. And yeah. uh, even though he tried to do so, Balaam tried to do so, the Lord would not permit him to, to do it. And so there's the, the famous instance of uh, Balaam, who's he's on a donkey. And the donkey keeps, you know, zigzagging, trying to swerve away from trouble. Uh, the donkey knows that there's trouble because he sees the the angel of the Lord with the flaming sword, and uh, and and Balaam doesn't. 
And so finally the Lord talks out of the donkey and, and speaks to this guy, you know, why, why do you keep hitting me? Because Balaam kept hitting the donkey. Uh, and so it's kind of a comical um, event because it just goes to show how, how dense this man is. Not only, not only that he's being scolded by a donkey, the Lord through the donkey, uh, but also that he's trying to go against God, right? You, you, you cannot go, you cannot prophesy against the one true God who ordains all things uh, for the good of his people. And, and so it, it's, it's harkening back to that Old Testament imagination and, and scriptural uh, history that uh, obviously in Pergamum was, was quite rich, that, that, that Jesus could speak to them and drop these stories, um, and it would have called to mind for them right away um, these Old Testament stories. Goes to show that, you know, it could have been a strong uh, Jewish Christian presence in Pergamum, uh, but, they, but they knew the scriptures. They, they knew... Uh, the story of, of Israel and that and they appropriated it for for themselves. So so Balaam and Balak are associated with opposition to God. Yeah, they're associated with idolatry. And that's in fact, part of the problem that this church in a very uh, religiously diverse setting struggles with is sexual immorality stemming from idolatry, the Nicolaitans, as we said earlier, uh, as present here as they appear to have been in Ephesus. Interesting, one note, just to make sure people understand, he refers to Antipas, who died for the faith, that is not Herod Antipas. Just to clarify that, you know, lots of people had the same names back then, uh, but Antipas is an, un it's a, beyond this reference, we don't really know too much about Antipas, except that he was a martyr of the early church and was killed for the sake of the faith in Pergamum. And that those who are who follow his path of faithfulness are promised here to eat of the hidden manna and to receive a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Well, of course, we know who, what name is written on that stone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Christians know it's, uh, it's, it's the saving name of Jesus as the notes in my Bible put really, really well. But, um the, the 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 let's just review this would be a nice sort of conclusion for the study let's just review the three things that are said at the end of each of these uh letters he uh the one who conquers the ephesians he says to the one who conquers i will grant to eat of the tree of life to the smyrnans he says to the one who con the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death that means the judgment, right? Mm -hmm. So that the judgment and the, the, the time when, when raw, evildoers are cast into hell, unbelievers cast into hell. So you'll, you'll, ha you'll eat the tree of life. You will, not be, you will not perish in the second judgment or in the, in the final judgment. And then third, you will receive hidden manna and the stone with the name of Jesus. Jesus often refer, you know, referred to referenced as the bread of life and also as the stone on which people stumble and on which God likewise, you know, builds his kingdom, the confession of the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That reference uh, to when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter is told, you are the rock. Um, and you are rock, Peter. And on this little rock of your confession, I will build my church. Uh, and so here, it's that confession of faith that's being given, passed on to the Pergam people in the Pergamumiums, <laughs> the people Pergam in Pergam, the Pergamum, the Pergamumites, Pergamumites. Pergamumites. Uh, yeah, fun. Anyway, you know that that confession of faith, that name of Jesus, that He is the foundation, uh, He is the cornerstone. Uh, with his apostles and prophets. So, but it's interesting that, that these three things, you'll, you'll eat from the tree, you'll have, you'll, you'll survive the judgment, you'll eat the manna and have the stone. You know, it, they, 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 it's starting to build a comfort, a book of comfort. These are the things that those who believe in Christ will receive. Mm -hmm. Eternal life, the bread of heaven, salvation, Salvation's basically defined in Holy Scripture as deliverance from judgment and the day of judgment, right? You'll be saved. You will not be condemned. Um, 
and and a share in the in the confession of the church and so what are the other comforts that will be given to those who conquer we will see in future letters but i think we need to end it there for today pastor would you pray for us absolutely the lord be with you and also with you let us pray gracious lord we give you thanks for the words that you spoke to the churches of revelation to encourage them to shepherd them to lead them to guide them and also to promise them uh, your grace and every blessing help us lord in the midst of our walk of faith if our love has grown cold that you would warm us up if our doctrine is faulty that you would correct us and that we would remember those who suffer for the faith those who are persecuted and imprisoned that you would open our hearts to remember them to support them in our prayers and with our finances and that you would bless your church throughout the world as it seeks to be faithful to be light in the midst of the darkness for your son jesus christ is the light of the world who has come into our lives who is in our churches that more and more people might see his glory and follow him unto life everlasting so bless us lord in this study and bless us this day as we go about our day that we may reflect your light in the midst of this fallen world. We ask all this and pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.